Man, <clears throat> awesome. Well, hello to everybody in here. Hello to everybody in venue too. You got your, the remodel looks good over there. They got the better screen. They got everything. It's getting awesome over on venue two side. And they have my wife over there. So everything's better on that side today. <laughs> the better half, literally. Awesome. Man, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I get to speak a message to you today called an unlikely uh, pairing. An unlikely pairing. And uh, I'll say this, just that sometimes God will connect you to some people that you just, have you ever met somebody you kind of, at the beginning you thought, that person's weird, I'd never be their friend. And then, then you're kind of like, a couple months go by and you're like, I can't live without that person, like I love them, you know, and you're just, come on, sometimes God wants to connect you in an unlikely pairing to do what he wants to do in your life. And it's good. And so we're going to talk about that today, and I'm really excited about it. I'm going to share a little bit from uh, the Bible. There's a book in the Bible that the short name for it is Acts, which just really literally means like the actions, not the acts that chopped people's heads off as <laughs> ACT. And what Acts is about is it's the part of the Bible that happens right after Jesus was crucified and then resurrected, and he literally handed the reins over to the disciples and said, you guys go do it. And they started just going crazy. The Holy Spirit filled them, started building the church, and it was amazing. So it's the actions of those guys and uh, gals and what they did and how God moved in them in the beginning. And there was all kinds of awesome things that happened. The church started growing really, really fast. Can I tell you what happens when a church grows really, really fast? You get all kinds of crazy comes into the church. Come on, somebody. You're sitting by somebody probably. You're like, it's you. He's talking about you. But as a church, the bigger a church gets, the more crazy comes into the church. Are you with me on this? Yeah. It's just science. And... Uh, but it's good, and that's what we want. Come on, when New Vintage started, you know, and there was like 14 of us or 20 of us in my living room in Vancouver praying about it, and a small group of people out here that came together and began to pray about it, we were praying for all you crazies to get here. And look, you're here. That's what we want, right? God wants to take and put an unlikely pairing of people together, and it's so awesome. So I want to read to you and share with you a little bit out of Acts about two characters that were in this crazy group. One is Barnabas. And here in chapter 4, this is what it says. For instance, there was Joseph, that's his given name, his birth name, one of the apostles nicknamed, uh, or which the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. And Barnabas means son of encouragement. That was what everybody called him. Now, can I just tell you, some of you have had a nickname that was son of a something else. And so this is a pretty, <laughs> this is a pretty good nickname if you think about it. And uh, so everybody likes Barnabas. He's got a good reputation. And in fact, it was mentioned about how great of a guy he was that it says he was from the tribe of Levi, which I think anytime you're from a clan that's named after genes, that's a good thing. And it also came from the cool island of Cyprus. So he's an islander, knows how to roast a pig. And he sold a field. I'm really on fire today, you guys. I'm really, <laughs> I just want you to know that. He sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and laid it before the apostles. The idea is this. He was bought in to everything that was going on with this explosive church growth. Like he even took and sold property and gave all that money to just help fund the gospel. Come on, I, I want some of that to happen today in our world, right? Where yeah. people just go, man, I got some properties. I got like just where they're so into what Jesus is doing. People are like, I can't do enough. But the thing about Barnabas is this, that Barnabas was just well-liked. Everybody liked him. Uh, he was, you know, he had a great nickname. He was encouraging. Everybody wanted him to be at their birthday parties, at all the, you know, everything that they could get around Barnabas. Have you ever met somebody that's like Barnabas? Everybody loves this guy. Yeah. You're probably thinking of me right now, but there might be others. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Nobody raised their hands. So <laughs> we're going to go back to chapter 9 now in the book. So there's another character, and this is one of the craziest that was going on. As the church is growing you had people that did not like this idea that Jesus was starting to grow a church of Jesus followers. In fact, there was a guy named Saul who actually got legal permission from the Jewish church to go and put people in prison that were Christians and to kill Christians. And he would, the Bible says that he would actually kill men and women. Like he was violently ruthless. Like he was a terrorist in a literal sense against Christianity. But here's what happens. This guy named Saul actually meets Jesus face to face. And it so changes him that he goes blind for a few days. He doesn't know who it is. Jesus has to explain, I'm Jesus and you're persecuting me. 
And it, in that encounter and in that dialogue and in those moments, Saul recognizes the fact Jesus is who he says he was. He was the Messiah and he was the Son of God and I need to change my view. And he has a radical turnaround and becomes one of the church, but he's still got the reputation that everybody knows that he's a violent murderer. And here's where Saul who comes from one side of the tracks and Barnabas from the other, get together in a crazy place called church. And here's what happens. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers. But they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. Can I just say this? In our church, we want everybody to come to New Vintage Church, right? We want people that are not Christians coming to our church. Like if you're a Christian, I'm not saying leave. I'm saying we want all your friends that don't know Jesus yet to come, right. right? Don't go inviting people that already got a church to come to this church. We want your friends that don't have a church, don't know Jesus, come to on. come to this church. You can say amen to that because that's good preaching right there. And here's the thing. When, when some of these people walk into this church, some of us are going to look and go, I saw you at that bar. I went to that same party you went to. I know what you do for a living. I know what you sold. I know what you buy. I know what you do. And people aren't going to believe that they actually got saved and started following Jesus. And, and they're going to be like a Saul. And they're going to come walking into our church. And we're going to have to decide if we're going to do what Barnabas did or not. And here's what Barnabas did. Barnabas brought him to the apostles, which is like the higher up crew of the church. And he told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. And he, he told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Here's what happened. Saul walks into the church. Nobody wants anything to do with him. Barnabas sees what's going on, goes, puts his arm around Saul and goes, oh, no, no, no. Our church ain't going to be like that. Walks him right into the elders meeting, the pastors meeting, sits down and goes, if he's out, I'm out. This guy legit believes in Jesus just like I do. And I'm with him. And you know, I gave a lot of money to this church and this guy gets to sit by me. And can I just say this? We got to be a church, if you've been here like four weeks or more, come on, that we're going to be Barnabases to every Saul that walks in this place. And we're going, if we're good enough to be in here, they're good enough to be in here. If they got faith in Jesus, absolutely. And man, sometimes God will take a Saul and a Barnabas, and they're an unlikely pair, and he'll put them together in the context of a church to display and to magnify and to show culture what humanity should look like. It's powerful. I didn't think this sermon was going to be this good, but I'm so encouraged right now. (laughs) It's good. Okay, I got a video that I want to show you um, just to kind of show you a video. I didn't have God. I didn't have a relationship with God and I felt kind of alone sort of here on earth. At New Vintage Church, we believe that small groups are a foundational piece of living for Christ. We're supposed to be in community with one another. Our relationship with God has got to go beyond just the hour and a half on Sundays. It's got to go beyond just our own selves and our own spiritual lives. We were made to be in relationship together with other people. We were made to be loved. We were made to love other people as well. Because of Jesus' love for us, we can love one another, and we can love each other well. It really grew me closer to God, and before I never had an intimate relationship with God, and made me realize, like, oh, Even me, who's made all these mistakes in my past, can still have that intimate relationship with God when I felt really lost before. I want to encourage everybody to make an intentional effort to be in a new vintage small group today. My life became bigger and better than I could ever imagine. I connected with a lot of great people. I ended up getting baptized. Instead of being just a believer, I'm a follower now. The closer I grew to God, it's like the blessings just kept pouring down on me. It all, everything has changed for the better.
No one fights alone. Make a choice to do life together today. Come on, that's great. I only have a couple things I talk about in my life. You know, like one of them is walking. You all know I walk if you've been here. Uh, I mean, everybody walks, but I mean, like, anyway, I go on walks. Well, when we were in Vancouver uh, in August, I was, uh, woke up from the hotel. We were visiting uh, our, our sending church, and I decided to walk around Vancouver Mall, and it, w- it was awesome. And they have a, a movie theater there called Cinetopia, which is like the epitome of what a movie experience should be. And I'm telling you, if you fall in love with Jesus and you love movies, you're probably going to heaven. Uh, I love going to the movies. Anybody love movies? <clears throat> yeah, don't watch the bad ones, but you know, the good ones are awesome. And so I'm walking, and they have like this 45 gi- foot giant poster of an upcoming movie, and it kind of inspired me for this message. I want to show you this is off my iPhone. I took a picture of this giant thing, and it's the new Justice League movie that comes out in November. Uh, and I, not that I'm counting, but I'm a little bit excited, no big deal. And it, I loved it. It says, You can't save the world alone. You can't save the world alone. The whole idea of, of God's church is that we would get paired together with some people and get on a team. Come on, we're not golf players in church. We're a football team. You don't get an individual score. It's what we do together on the offense and defense that counts, and that's how we score and win. And so we're not going to win the world by ourselves, but when we do something together, come on, God can be in that. And it just kind of inspired me. So that's the the title, (coughs) Uh, Unlikely Pairing, and some of the graphics are from my walk in Vancouver. I read a book this summer about Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life, and uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. He said, to be a Christian, one must live with Christians. Now, that doesn't mean like if you're in an apartment or, you know, somebody in your family is not a Christian, you got to move out. What it means is this. He was saying, if you're really going to live the Christian life, to really be Christian, there's got to be a part of your life that you live your life with other Christians. Now, that's a part of it. Other people would also say, you also got to live around some non-Christians. For sure, we get that. They're everywhere. But you got to do some of your life with other Christian people to encourage you and that you could encourage them and be a Barnabas to them. And it's great. I love the idea of an unlikely pairing. Now, uh, I got sick, you know, a couple weeks back, and I got pneumonia. I've never had pneumonia. I, it's awful because you feel sick when you're sick. I don't know if you know that. And uh, it's how I felt and I was out for like 10 days, and so I, I read four books, uh, which is a lot, and I watched a lot of TV, and I slept a lot. There's just not a lot to do when you're sick, but you know what I do when I'm sick and I can't eat? I watch Food Network. <laughs> is anybody with me on this? This is like therapy, and I love like, getting inspired and watching that, and it's always tougher in the 11 a.m. service when I talk about food, but I'm going to because <clears throat> I know lunch is coming, but I, I, here's some unlikely pairings in food that uh, I, I saw on the internet the other day, I want to put these up on the screen for you, some unlikely pairings, uh, avocado and chocolate. And I went, you know, I just don't know if I could do that. Now, some people say you put them together and it's amazing. Okay, I don't know about that. Let's show the next one. Uh, then these avocado people from California have gone crazy. They're like coffee, avocado, milkshake. And I'm, look, I, I understand if you love your avocados, but this is pushing the line here. So the next one chocolate fettuccine with mascarpone and lemon. Now listen, when I have pasta, I'm not sure I want sweet and lemon, although separately these all sound amazing. I'll show you a couple more things that happened here. Olive oil and ice cream. Again, the devil, I think, got a hold of this one. I can't believe that that could taste good. The next one is uh, peanut butter and bacon. Now there's a winner. Come on. Those are like two of my favorite. Those are, that's like, that's like the Father and the Son. All you need is the Holy Spirit, and you've got it. You know, like <laughs> peanut butter and bacon. Like, so I'm going to try that one. Okay, the next one that's an unlikely pairing is goat milk and caramel. No. And then, uh, <laughs> seriously, yeah. Sriracha, <laughs> sriracha and peanut butter and an egg. <clears throat> I'm willing to try this, but it looks a little sick. Like the photo quality doesn't help. Okay, the next one. Now, broccoli and, and Cheetos. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm going to try this today because I have some frozen broccoli at the house. And I may or may not have Cheetos or go buy some. But the point is, some of the parents in here, some of the moms are like, light bulbs are going off like, 
I can get my kids to eat some broccoli. <laughs> the unlikely pairing, though, sometimes create combinations and things that are, are wonderful. And listen, I think that, that in our lives, God wants to connect you to some people that at one point you would never pick them. You wouldn't go, you'd never look at them in a lineup and go, I think they would be friends of mine. I think I could really do life with them. But in the church world, God will do an unlikely pairing and then they become an essential part of your life. You know, have you ever just, you got any good friends right now that when you first met them, you just thought that person's awful? You don't have to lie if you're sitting, if it's your spouse. That's just, you know, just, you don't have to say amen out loud, just in your head, you know. All right. I want to talk to you about a couple people that were unlikely pairings in my life. One is I'm going to show you a picture of Stephen and Katie Tease. Uh, Stephen Tease. Ah. Uh, Golly, what a messed up human being that guy is. Um, he's not here today, and so I can just say whatever I want. This is awesome. Katie was in our youth group back in Vancouver, and Stephen, uh, she graduated, and Stephen came into our church. He got out of the military. He's a Marine, and he was really messed up. His whole family life, if he ever told you his story, just a lot of crazy things. He never had any kind of church background, anyone in his family. Had no sense of just how good God could be, and here he's in the Marines, and one of his good friends committed suicide right before he got out, and it really wrecked him. He came to a small group before he came to church, and he gave his heart to Jesus at a small group. And then he comes to church and came to our church that we were at and got involved in the youth ministry and stuff like that, and we began to connect with him. I, I thought it would be a great idea to put him in charge of a small group of junior high boys, and then I had somebody complain that they were going to leave the church, and they were a parent of the junior high kid in the group. I said, why? And they said, because Stephen Tease is... Uh, cussing in the small group, you know, the church small group. And I said, let me investigate, and it was true. And, uh, but he was correctable, and he grew, you know, and, and it was awesome. And, you know, he's very intense. If you know Stephen, he's super passionate and really intense. And now he's working with our interns, so I think all our interns this year will be saved by the end. It's going to be awesome. And uh, he's just like, you know, but here's the thing. I would have never thought Stephen would, would be close to me, but he came on this church plan, and part of the reason why we have New Vintage today is because he upped his family and moved with us to come here, and he's still with us today. I'm going to go the distance with this couple. I love these guys, and I'm telling you, it was an unlikely pairing at the beginning, but now it's an essential part of my life. Let me tell you another story. A guy in our church named Sal. How many of you ever met Sal? He was our children's bodyguard. You know, he'd check and make sure that no weirdos were going back in the kids' area. He, big, tall guy, six foot four, not a small man. And uh, he would, the only bad thing about him is he would wear um, Dallas Cowboys jerseys to church. <laughs> but again, we prayed for everybody to come to our church. So, you know, and he got in, he was driving back from California this summer, about two and a half months ago, and he got in a head on car wreck with a semi. And it almost killed him and his two daughters in his, in his car. One of his daughters had two fractures in her skull and two in her face. And she almost died. They had to remove part of her skull and let her brain swelling go down before they could patch that back up. And she's okay. The other daughter just had scrapes. And some of you saw on Facebook, he actually lost his left arm. They had to amputate it. It was pinned under the truck for four hours. And, and it, it's a miracle that he lived. And immediately when that happened, it was during our kids' camp, Josh, who was the one who brought him to our church, drove down to Portland to see him. And, of course, he couldn't talk. And Lisa and I, when we went to Portland, we went and visited him, too. And still he had a, a thing in his throat. He couldn't speak, and he was kind of out. They kept him in a coma for a long time to, to let his body try to heal. And then yesterday I get a phone call, and it's Sal on the phone talking to me. I didn't recognize the number, so I let it go to voicemail, which is what I'm going to do to you. It's just saying it's normal. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And I just like, it's Sal. So I talked to him on Saturday. And he's like, man, I'm doing good. He goes, I just want to thank the church. He goes, so many people like donated to that Kickstarter thing from the church for my family. And he goes, so many people prayed. And, he, and all these people sent all these great notes on Facebook and sent things. And people came and visited. And he goes, man, I just, I'm so grateful. He goes, when I came to the church, he goes, I didn't have any faith in God, but I gave my heart to Jesus. He got baptized here, and he said, 
man, I think it was my faith in Jesus and New Vintage Church that carried me through this. And I went, man, that's awesome. He goes, would you please tell the church thank you? And I said, no, Sal, you send me a video message. I'm going to show it to the church tomorrow. So I want you to see Sal here. Hey, New Vintage, I want to thank you guys for all the <coughs> prayers, the donations. Uh, day by day, I'm getting better. I'm recuperating. I want to thank you guys. Uh, my daughter, Kalia, she's, she's recuperating. She's doing better. She's at home already. Um, I love you guys. You guys are amazing to me. And uh, thank you guys very much. Come on, that's a, that's a miracle right there that you're seeing. That's a miracle. And can I tell you that it's real? You connect to this church. You put in a little bit of roots. I'm telling you, nobody fights alone here. That's real for us. And you get in an accident, we're going to come see you. You're in trouble, we're going to come see you. You get married, you get a promotion, we're going to cheer you on. Come on, we're in this together. And it might be an unlikely pairing, but God is going to do something beautiful with the relationships in this church. Man, I, I want to share with you three values uh, that I have come to personally attach myself to. And I think they're really directly from the Bible's values. And I want to share with you about uh, relationship values, a couple key thoughts. Number one is that you got to love people anyways. And I say it like that because, listen, I, I love coming to church and seeing you all. But on Mondays sometimes I just want to quit. Like people drive me crazy. You know what I'm saying? And just like the reality of humanity, it's great. And then sometimes it wears you out. But really, I just love what I get to do. I'm so privileged to be, you know, in this church, let alone its pastor. But I'm telling you that you've got to decide that you're going to make a commitment to love people anyways, no matter what they do. People want to go to church and go, it should be a safe place. Nobody should hurt me or offend me. And I should be able to let my guard down. Are you kidding me? A bunch of weirdos go to this church, and it's going to be awful sometimes. Now, should it be better than it's out in the world? Absolutely, but I'm just going to be real with you. You're going to have to make a choice to love people anyways because it'll get challenged sometimes. You know, when I was in uh, college, Bible college, I had one of my best friends. He got engaged, and he gave me a speech, and he said, uh, now that I'm going to be getting married, uh, you're still single. I'm gonna, I'm not, we're not going to be able to hang out as much. I'm going to be another stage of life. Well, it was humiliating, number one, that he had to point out my singleness, you know, and then... Like, I'm moving on. Then I got a roommate that I had the year before, went off to a different school. And so now I had a roommate that wouldn't talk to me. Uh, and it was just, I just had a really bad experience. And I remember I, I was just so devastated by a bunch of friendships that had gone bad. And I'm like 20 years old. And I remember telling Lisa, you know, sitting in the cafeteria uh, one, one evening, I said, I'm never going to make any more friends. It's too painful. And Lisa was like, pull it together, Matt Malt. And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, I'll make some friends. And, you know, and, but have you ever come to the end where you just go, I'm done? And I'm telling you that you got to kind of just go, I might feel like that today, but I'm not going to feel like that forever. And you got to love people anyway. And come on, the river of humanity is tricky waters, but it's worth it. And I'm telling you, God can give you grace. And because God loved you and loved me, when we didn't deserve it, we can risk being hurt again, even in church world. Love people anyways. Uh, Wired Magazine had a 2010 cover story. said this, the secret to health and happiness, question mark, it's your friends. Wired Magazine, come on. I was reading a book this uh, last month called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, and uh, he said some great things. He talks about how he invited this a uh, lady who's a, a great big CEO, to come in and mentor him. And he was going to pay her to help him become a greater leader. And this is the story. The day of our first meeting, sitting in my office, we barely had a chance to exchange pleasantries before I blurted out, what do I need to do to become a great leader? Nancy Bedore looked around my office a few minutes and said nothing. And when she finally spoke, it struck me to the core. Keith Look at all the pictures on your wall. You talk about aspiring to become a great leader, and there's not one picture uh, in your whole office of anybody but you. You with other famous people, you in famous places, you winning awards. There's not one picture here of your team or anything that might indicate that your team is accomplished, 
uh, that would lead anybody, oh, excuse me, to care for them as much as you care for yourself. Do you understand that it's your team's accomplishments and what they do because of you, not for you, that will generate your mark as a leader? And it changed something in Keith Ferrazzi. And I, I, I read that and I went, dear God, help me to be a good leader and love my team and not just be driving on my own self-centered path. You know what I mean? I'm telling you, there's something powerful when you give up your own to care for your own. And it's just a great way. And I'm telling you, we've got to think like Barnabas and love the Saul's. And the scripture that is so clear to me is where John writes in 1 John, we love each other because he first loved us. And really, that's the truth. The reason we even can risk relationship here is because God already risked relationship knowing that we could reject him, but he did it anyway. So I want to say it again, love people anyway. It's a value. Number two value is this, put down some roots. I'm going to preach a little bit right here. Y'all okay with that? Some of you got to put down some roots. The grass isn't greener somewhere else. You got to water your grass. And you got to just quit fantasizing about all these other places and things. And and you got to go, I'm going to make it work right here. I'm going to put down some roots and I'm going to be a blessing around me. You know what happens when you don't put down roots? You will travel from church to church, relationship to relationship, picking good fruit off of other people's trees. But God's plan for you was for you to put down some roots and you to grow some fruit that would be a blessing to people around you. And some of you haven't been planted long enough and gone through some hard winters and some tough winds and some fire seasons to where all of a sudden you go, no, man, I'm getting stronger because I put my roots down and now I can be a blessing to people that come around me. And that's what God wants out of our lives. He wants us to put down some roots. Man, I love um, Damian Lillard, Portland Trailblazers. And uh, I'm a Seahawks fan, believing with all my faith for today. Come on, somebody. And uh, God will be with us. And I know there's other believers believing for other teams, but God is with the Seahawks. I just firmly believe that. But here's the deal. There's not a team, in, a basketball team anymore, and we grew up in Portland, so come on, the Molt family, and some of you, come on, we love the Portland Trailblazers. There was a great thing. Somebody tweeted at Damian Lillard, and they said, you're so talented, Damian, but you're going to have to go to another city if you want to win a ring. And here's what he tweeted back. He said, I'm willing to not win it if I can't build it where I am. I went, that'll preach right there. I'm willing to not like be world famous. I'm willing to, I don't care about any of that other stuff. I'm going to win what I can win here with this team. Can I just say that, yeah, God might be moving in places around the world, in Bethel, in New York, in, in Sydney, but God loves Tri-Cities. And God can show up and people who would pray, get their relationships right, obey everything Jesus says to do in their life. Of people like that, God will show up and do something crazy in a no-name place. And I want to win it right here. All right. I'll just move down a little bit. Carl, Carl Lentz said, if you're rooted, you won't leave because of an offense and you won't leave for a better offer. I'm telling you, when people just decide, you're driving me crazy. I've had enough of you, but I'm going to stick it out and work with you. When, when people do that, that's when the church becomes a church and it's different than every other place in the world. This is the only place that forgiveness, which is so unnatural, should become natural and allow us to grow. That's what Jesus wants us to be like. So put down some roots. Amen. Number three value is this. Church is God's plan. It's not something we made up. I'm not getting rich off this. This isn't an institution. It doesn't matter how big our church gets. This is relationships, and it's centered around who Jesus is. And it's Jesus' idea to gather his children together. It's always going to be his plan. People can try other things, but God wanted to gather his kids together. And there's something he wants to do in us when we're together. He wants there to be a sound of praise for him. He wants us to be a blessing to one another. It's his plan. It's just who he is and his idea. And I believe that to change the world, God will use the church. And that's why when I saw that movie poster, it just wanted you to see it again here. I just thought it's so cool. You can't save the world alone. You and Jesus by yourself just won't do it. Listen, if you 
by yourself and Jesus could save the world, you'd start getting people saved, get them baptized, pray for them to be filled with the Spirit. You'd have to start a group. And if it grew, you'd call it a church (laughs) because Jesus wants to gather his kids together. But God does want to use superheroes, come on somebody, together, that's us, to do something significant. And it's awesome. Here's a great, great quote for you. Success in life is two things. The people you meet and what you create together. Success in life is the people you meet plus what you create together. Listen, I'm going to tell you why our church uh, uh, Inspire Conference is going to be so killer. It's going to be in a good way, killer in a good way. I know I talked about Saul being a killer. I meant, let me think. I'll tell you why Inspire Conference is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome because it's our team is on it. I'm not even, I don't even know some of the details, but our team is just working hard, and there's people going to volunteer. It's going to be amazing because it's what we do together. We're going to see a lot of people come to Jesus that weekend. We're going to see people find hope again. Come on, people are going to get healed. They're going to get restored in their soul because God does something powerful when we come together. Man, here, I'm going to end with this. Four, four quick things that are lessons I've learned in relationships. Are you all ready for this? Four things I've learned. In relationships. Number one, the greatest pain in life and the greatest healing in life comes in relationships. Listen, you can't live life very long and not recognize that some of the deepest pain you're ever going to experience is going to be because of loss or broken relationships. Like, that's just real. But here's the thing. When that happens, when people isolate themselves and go, go, go away and get alone and decide it's not worth the risk anymore, they don't experience healing because healing also comes in relationships. And so... Like, the times that I've really been down and really needed something, man, I've called sometimes my elders and some friends in the church and friends from other places that are safe people for me. And and, and when they've come and just put their hands on my shoulders or called me and just said, you're going to make it. I want you to know that tell me about the darkest moment. And I'm just, you know, a wreck. And I'm just sharing my heart and just blah. And a friend goes, I get it. I understand, I'm hearing you, and I'm with you. Let's take a step of walking out of this death valley, and let's pray that God give you some grace to move forward in this. It's when I go, okay, take my hand, let's go. You know, and I, it's in those places that you can't get there by yourself. You've got to have some people that would walk with you healing. It, it wasn't ever Jesus' plan to just have us have just him. When, when Jesus heals the one guy, who was a leper, total outcast in society. You know what Jesus does? He heals him. But then Jesus says something very interesting, and this has been something that's just echoed in my mind so many years. Jesus says, go and show yourself to your local church pastor and let him examine your life and let him declare you clean. And there was something that Jesus goes, I'm going to save you, but I want you to go back into the church and let people get involved in your life. And declare you're all right. Because there's something wonderful when we get to act as God's agents and go, I receive you. I love you anyway. I forgive you. I think you're great and you've got potential and destiny. There's something that God works through people in our lives. So, man, it's, it's, it's a, a wonderful thing. And relationships are tricky. You know, uh, Mitch album said this. He said, build a little community of those you love and who love you. And I'm telling you that it's a wonderful thought to have that in life. Second thing I've learned about relationships is this. Sometimes God chooses our friends. You know, what's interesting in church is, you know, when you're in high school and college, you get to choose your friends. But sometimes in church, you don't get to choose your friends. God chooses friends. He puts an unlikely pair together to make something wonderful. God wants you to have some diversity in your life. He wants you to be around some people who didn't grow up where you grew up. He wants you to be around a healthy, in a healthy way. Guys learn how to relate to, to females and females relating to guys in a healthy way. Please don't read into that anything else. But God wants us to, uh, young people like me, kind of, to relate to older people. He wants some of the younger people to relate to people my age, which is the best age right now for me. And uh, like he wants us to have diversity in how we see each other and in our relationships. And we might not choose that just out in the world. But come on, in the church, God will put us together, and it's his gift to us. It's his gift to us. 
Some people have judged church. In fact, our church, I've heard this. People go, oh, that church, I'm not going to go there. It's all clicky. Well, let's clarify something here. <clears throat> I'm putting on my boxing gloves right here. Some people walk into the church and they might be seeing covenant relationships where people got this down. They're going, I'm committed to these relationships. And they're laughing together, they're hanging out together, and they're jealous because they don't have that. But that might not be a click. That might be some covenant relationships. Here's what a click is, and a click is evil. A click is when you get four girls in a, in a room or four guys in a room, and all they do is stand and talk to each other, and people walk by, and they look them up and down, and they're all named Bethany, and they all have the same haircut, and they all, you know, and you can't tell which one is which. Are those triplets, quadruplets? No, those are, you know, and it's just like, and they'll never open their circle. An, a, a covenant relationship looks like this. I got my tight friends. I'm committed to them, but I got one foot out of that circle, and I'm like, hey, Come on in here. This is so good. We're not afraid to add somebody. That's covenant relationships right there. Covenant relationships are not threatened by adding people to your little group. If you want to be a click, get out. Don't leave here, but don't take that out. Like, I got ahead of myself verbally, and, you know, I'm going to just kind of reel that back in. And just say that God chooses your friends. All right, good. That's a good thought. Here's a great quote for you. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. We were made up of thousands of others. Everyone who's ever done a kind deed for us, spoken one word of encouragement to us, has entered into the makeup of our character and our thoughts as well as our success. Come on. We didn't get here by ourselves. God connected people in our lives that are here. Barnabas maybe would have never chosen Saul, and Saul would have maybe never chosen Barnabas. But God arranged that and chose that friendship, and they went out and did missions work, planted churches, changed the world, saw miracles happen together, and God orchestrated that. The third thing I've learned about relationships is this, that God-based relationships have surprise blessings in them. Like sometimes you receive something from somebody you just didn't even know they were gifted at or whatever, and sometimes it's just a wonderful way that God wants to surprise you with something really good out of a relationship that originally you thought was an unlikely pairing. I love this. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Every man I meet is my superior in some way, and in that I learn from him. It's got to be the humility that we would have. And then I, I love this. This was at our friend's house. We went over and had a meal at their kitchen uh, or in their dining room table, and on the wall, they had this on a mural, and it was this, the sun, not the son of God, the sun, just life, looks down on nothing half so good as a household laughing together over a meal. There's something good about people coming together. And listen, we got donuts today, got small group leaders going to be outside to talk to you, and, you know, and uh, for you to meet them or whatever, and, and sometimes small groups will um, have food because if you don't know what to talk about, at least there's food. And sometimes we, we don't know how to, you know, so we trick people. I have burritos. And people are like, yes. We're like flies to the light. You know, food. And uh, so that's why small groups have food a lot. And it's a good strategy, right? And so I think, I think it's wonderful. Can I just say this? I want to challenge all of you to not go through the end of September and into October without inviting somebody over to your house. Or maybe you can't have them over to your house, but... Go to Taco Bell with them. Go to Red Robin with them. Meet them for coffee. Get somewhere and just connect and, and don't keep being an island. Don't keep sitting in the same seat, same section, and never introducing yourself to somebody else. And you're going to have to do that. Come on. You might have a surprise blessing waiting for you from God. My fourth and final thought is this. You've got to be intentional in building relationships. You can't. Listen, I know there's two kinds of people there's like real outward people and people that are very shy and inward people. And if you're kind of an inward person and you kind of want to just go, well, I, want, I think everybody should be coming and finding me and nobody invited me and all that. Can I just speak to you for a minute? It doesn't matter your personality type. I want you to take a big, huge step forward and put yourself out there and extend a hand and go, and you need to say these words, you know, I'm Matt. Unless your name's not Matt, then say something else. But you need to take that step and go out of your comfort zone because you've got to be intentional. And can I say this, that if you're like a, a Barnabas, life of the party, you always got people around, 
Can I tell you that there are hundreds of people coming through this church that if we just continue to be the life of the party within our circles and are not aware, man, there's wonderful people coming into this church. And we got to open up our lives and our circles and go, I got room at my table for you. Listen, I'm telling you that God just, I think God wants to do something so amazing at New Vintage Church. Like I'm convinced of that. But it's going to take intentionalness. And man, I know I'm not preaching a lot of theology today. I know I'm not sharing the gospel today in that sense. You know, in a, this is God's plan. Like we got to, if you get people to come to a meal with you and have coffee with you, you can share the gospel with them. You can be healing for them. And we got to just decide if we're just going to make Sundays like a thing I go to or if it's something that's going to be like, I'm going to get the tattoo. I'm joining the clan. I'm making it mine. I'm putting my roots down. I'm going to choose and let God, some friends, I'm going to let God choose the rest. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a part of this. I'm telling you, you'll have the greatest joy in life if you'll become what the, the vision that God has for his church, if you'll embrace that. I was, uh, I saved a Starbucks cup for a really, really long time. Remember back when Starbucks cups had like little sayings on them, like little quotes? Most of them were stupid, but there was one really good one. And uh, here, here's what it said. And this is about being committed and intentional. The irony of commitment is that it's deeply liberating. And most people think that commitment is actually makes you feel like, oh, I'm boxed in. It's not true. It's deeply liberating. In work, in play, in love, the act of commitment frees you from the tyranny of your internal critic and from the fear that likes to dress itself up and parade around as rational hesitation. To commit is to remove your head as the barrier to your life. Man, when you just commit to something and you go, I'm just gonna do that, it just solves all the issues around it and now it's just like, no, I'm doing that. I'm telling you, I wanna ask you to commit to this today. We bought donuts and we're gonna have all our small group leaders outside and we, we thought it was really clever to say, do not do life alone. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a winner. <clears throat> we stole that from other, some other church. Do not, do not, donut, you got it. So here's the thing. Y'all get free donuts today, and, you know, we did it for small groups, and I did it to have an excuse to have <laughs> donuts at church, you know. But uh, they're, all my small group leaders are going to be in these green T-shirts like this, and... They're either a co-host or a host of a, of a small group, and they're going to be outside. And I would just say this. When you leave church today, don't go to your car as fast as you normally do. Slow down. And it's okay if you don't go to a small group. You can still have a donut. <laughs> Some people are like, I'm not going, but I just, can I, you know. <clears throat> but do this. Stop. And they're on different days of the week. And, you know, we already, we launched them last week, and we already have three of them that are full. Like, their houses are just packed but there's a whole bunch more groups. And, and maybe you're just standing there and you're just gonna meet somebody that could end up being an unlikely pairing in your life that God's gonna use for his glory. So we're gonna sing a chorus and we're gonna close out today. And at the end of the chorus, at the end of the singing, we're gonna have people in venue two and venue one up at the front. And I know that some of you have been hurt before. And I'm telling you that don't just leave here with that hurt. If it's just highlighted to you, come up to somebody that's on the prayer team and just go, would you just pray with me? You don't have to tell them anything. Just say, man, just, I just need prayer. They'll pray with you. I'm telling you, that's how healing comes to our hearts is through relationships. So would you stand with me? We're going to sing and then we'll dismiss.